Wow. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm going to give you sort of an overview. Uh, I'm, first of all, I'm going to assume most of you know who I am, <laughs> or you wouldn't have been here. Uh, but just real quick, just a little bit of a testimony. Uh, I grew up in a Christian family, a Christian environment. My dad was a Baptist minister when I was a kid. I accepted Yeshua when I knew him as Jesus at age seven. I've uh, been in some form of ministry my entire life, starting with Vacation Bible School in my parents' front yard. You guys remember that? <laughs> some of you might remember Vacation Bible School. Um, later in high school, uh, some of my friends and I, we started what we called the God Squad, and we would meet for prayer in the morning uh, in, by the library before we went to our secular school, uh, just to sort of start our day, and the school was gracious enough to let us uh, use one of the classrooms on Tuesday evenings to have uh, Bible studies after, after school. So I did that until I went to the Army, and then some of us that were in the God Squad in high school together carried that into the military with us, uh, and then I got out of the military in 93, did uh, about 10 years worth of corporate video, and then, yes, everybody's, I don't know if I can keep doing that for five hours, but <laughs> I'll try to speak as loud as I can. Um, and then I got out of uh, doing corporate video in 2004 and was hired as a missionary and traveled to over a dozen countries in six and a half years as a multimedia missionary. Um, is this a, that will save my voice, thank you. I will have laryngitis if I don't. <laughs> is this tied into the sound system, is that better? Oh, yes. Wee, cool. Uh, so, yeah, I was a missionary for six and a half years. And then in 2009, the Lord started to put a call on my life to leave what I was doing in the International Missions Organization to, of all things, start talking about aliens, UFOs, Nephilim, and weird and crazy stuff like that. Of course, my family thought I was completely insane, and a lot of my <laughs> fellow believers did as well. Like, what are you doing? Um, I have always had the gift of evangelism. It's never been a problem for me to share my faith and see good results from it. Um, and I had a pretty decent sized fruit basket, I would say, uh, up until 2009. And then when I started talking about aliens, UFOs, Nephilim, and all that kind of stuff, I was amazed at the exponential increase in my fruit basket. Because some of the things that we're going to talk about this weekend are actually roadblocks that atheists and agnostics have to accepting our view of God. I don't know about you, but throughout the Old Testament, I, I didn't get very far into the Torah and even other places in the Old Testament where I'd have to close the book because it didn't make sense to me. Uh, when we get to the New Testament, we see that Jesus is having this conversation with Philip, and Philip says, show us the Father, and it'll be sufficient. And Philip, you know, Jesus says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Well, that never computed in my head because Yeshua is this amazing guy. He's loving publicans and sinners. He's hanging out with the only people he's judgmental towards are the religious people. <laughs> you know, he's this amazing, loving guy, but yet there's his father, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out everything throughout the Old Testament. And it just, it never computed in my head. And so we're going to talk about some of that uh, here this weekend because when you understand what's really going on in Genesis chapter 6, uh, Steve Quayle is fond of saying that it's the Rosetta Stone for understanding the rest of Scripture, and, and I have to agree with him now that I do understand it. Um, and so that's one thing. And uh, the more I got into that type of research, the more fruit I started to see come in because it broke down the walls and barriers that a lot of people who become atheists and agnostics put up. The other thing that I found in dealing with athe atheists and agnostics is, believe it or not, many of them know the Bible better than most Christians do. And they have the, well, what about this? What about that? And most Christians don't have a clue how to answer it because they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so we're going to address some of those things here this weekend. Here's uh, the agenda, at least, uh, you know, man plans, God laughs. <laughs> so we'll kind of see what happens. But um, this is, uh, are we getting feedback from something? Or I'm getting signals here. Do what? Unplug this one. This? The two, the two, the two in red and white. This one? Yeah. There we go. We can get all the technical <laughs> problems out of the way here. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, part one, can we trust Genesis? Part two is what I call the Hua Triangle, Adam, Abraham, and the Garden of Eden. How many of you were here uh, for the last time that I spoke, uh, what was it, six, eight months ago, something like that? Last year? 
who, July, it was July. How many of you were not here when I spoke in, in July? Okay, well, a little over half it looks like. So uh, for some of you it'll be review of what we covered last time, for the rest of you it'll be some new material. Uh, when it comes to the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey, I am not at all dogmatic about how you pronounce it because I think that there's a lot of, uh, a good case can be made for a lot of the different pronunciations people use. Yahweh is one of the most popular ones. King James says Jehovah. Some say Yahovah because there was no J. Some say Yahuwah because there's no V. Um, I eventually landed on Yahuwah mainly because of the pronunciation of the names of the prophets where you have a number of prophets who have the name of God incorporated into their name like Yahu, Jeremiah, Eliyahu, Elijah. And when the, the different names that incorporate the name of God into their name, they pronounced it with Yahu. So again, I'm not dogmatic. I'm not a sacred name or anything like that. It just, it's the name that I have uh, landed on. I've gone through all of them. <laughs> there were times when I used Yahweh, times when I used Jehovah. I'm on Yahuwah now, but hopefully this is not a bone of contention. I don't think we need to be fighting over something like that. We're doing the best we can with consonants. <laughs> you know. So the third presentation is called The Seed War Begins, and that's going to incorporate these three bullet points. The Genesis 6 experiment, the pre-flood return of the Nephilim. Most people never heard of that. And, of course, the post-flood return of the Nephilim. Tomorrow uh, we're going to talk about Babylon rising and the first shall be last. And part five, the Archon invasion, the mark of the beast, and the modern return of the Nephilim. Now, of course, just looking at these titles, I can already imagine that in an audience this size, I'm going to have three responses here. Uh, some of you are going to just say, well, isn't that interesting? Never heard that before. Hmm. Okay, cool. Some of you are going to suggest that I buy stock in tinfoil, and you're going to think I'm completely insane, out of my mind. Why did we even drive however long you drove to get here? then there's going to be a third group that's going to search and see if these things be true. That is my hope. I'm not here to try to convince you of anything. I don't want to convince you of anything. I want to share some things with you that hopefully you will take notes and think about and consider because I really do believe that condemnation before investigation is the height of ignorance. So if you condemn before hearing the whole thing and start throwing rocks at me, I'm going to accuse you of throwing rocks from the top of Mount Ignorance. All right? Hear the whole thing and, and then decide. Uh, search and see if these things be true. So with that said, I'm going to tell you up front, do not believe a thing I say. All right? Just don't believe me. We see Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 to prove or test all things. Hold fast which is that which is good. All right? Prove it. Test it for yourself. I'm just going to share what I feel uh, I've been learning along my journey. And along the lines of what the uh, condemnation before investigation, we see that uh, King Solomon said, He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame unto him. Aristotle said, It is the mark of an educated man to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And the longer version of the condemnation before investigation was by Herbert Spencer. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is a proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. Now, whatever we may think of these three men and what they have done in their life, that's irrelevant in my mind right now. I agree with these three statements that these three individuals said. So with that, I'm going to ask you a few questions before we begin. Can we agree on these two core essentials? that Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes up to the Father except through him. Can we agree on that? Yes. Yes. Can we agree that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God? It is not of works. Yes. We agree on that. Yeah. Okay, we're off to a good start. Can we agree on this? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Can we agree on this? Yes. Very good. So with that said, then I believe that the scriptures in the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by men. Therefore, it is our source for truth, and we can take it literally. And when I say we can take it literally, by that I mean it is understood that the Bible does in several cases talk in metaphorical terms and symbolic terms and allegorical terms, uh, parables, right? So in that sense, we could take it literally that the author is talking in a metaphor or talking in a, a parable, right? So I, it's my position that the Bible should be taken literally except for when it tells you not to. Behold, a parable. Oh, okay. I'm going to think about a parable, right? <laughs> hey, John, you know that weird freaky beast you just looked at? Here's what it means. 
Oh, okay, it's a symbol. We clear on that? Yeah. So, would you all agree that we can take the Bible literally within those parameters? Yes. Anybody disagree? Okay, then we're going to have some fun. <laughs> Part one, can we trust Genesis? Why would I even ask that question? Well, uh, this is my seventh year of doing Torah cycle readings, um, you know, where we go through the Torah in a year. This is, we are now in the beginning of our seventh year going through it. And it was probably about the second or third, I want to say it was the second cycle, that uh, my wife said to me one day, she said, you know, honey, why don't, we, why don't we read both ends of the Bible toward the middle? Read Genesis and Revelation and Exodus and Jude and sort of kind of work our way toward the middle. I thought, well, I've done a lot of one-year Bible plans before. That's a unique idea. I've never thought of anything like, okay, yeah, sure. Well, we didn't get very far into doing that when I very quickly realized that Revelation is just an amped up repeat of Exodus. In fact, I put together these uh, Torah study workbook guides and in the introduction of the Exodus workbook, I put together a chart right in the in very beginning of the introduction that shows the parallels of the, pl of the plagues of Exodus with the plagues in judgments given in the book of Revelation. So I'm like, wow, that's just absolutely amazing because uh, you know, I'm assuming because you guys are here on, on Shabbat and many of you are Torah observant and, and uh, that you probably came from standard evangelical background. Some of you may be even dispensational evangelical background. Would that be true? Yeah. Did, did a majority of you probably come from uh, dispensation theology and many probably pre-trib rapture mindset? Uh, who did not come from that background? Raise your hand. Okay, like three out of maybe, what, 70 or something? Yeah. So the majority of us, we grew up in this dispensation background. Now, as you started to move your way into studying Torah, did you kind of go through a, a reality check and a little bit of shock and awe when you started to realize who you really were? And if you were into eschatology and studying end, end times, did you realize that most of your library had to go in the garbage? <laughs> or at least be used for cross-referencing to realize how wrong you were? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I used to be really into end time prophecy, eschatology, all that stuff, and, and you know, Tim LaHaye left behind and all that stuff, uh, you know, uh, have my own charts that I would make up, you know, laying out the end times and stuff like that. And after I started reading Jeremiah and the prophets and going through the Torah and realizing Revelation's an amped up repeat of Exodus, all that stuff's got to change. It, it goes out the window. There's a whole different plan. I believe we're looking at a second Exodus, a greater Exodus, but that's a whole weekend seminar in and of itself right there, and I know Zach's got a lot of work on that. Isaiah 46.10 says that God declares the end, i.e. revelation, from the beginning. So I've titled this weekend the Genesis Revelation, how Yahuwah has revealed the end from the beginning. You know that Paul also agrees with this when he says in 1 Corinthians 10.11, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The stuff that happened in the Torah happened as an example for us on whom the ends of the world have come. And Genesis is amazing because it sets the stage for everything, doesn't it? In the beginning, right? It starts from creation, goes all the way through the house of Jacob coming down uh, during the time of the famine, right? And, and God said that I'm going to take... I believe there's 70 individuals at that time, and I'm going to make you a nation in the land of Egypt, right? And, of course, you got the blessing of, of Jacob over Ephraim and Manasseh and the whole thing that takes place there. So that's quite a, a long time period right there that's covered in Genesis. So you almost have to think of Genesis as like a cliff notes of human history from creation all the way up until, you know, just before the Exodus starts, right? That's a lot of time, and it covered a lot of ground. Of course, it all starts in Genesis chapter 1. So let's go ahead and read through this here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Wow, a lot of stuff going on right there. <laughs> um, so let's look at the word firmament. Strong's number 7549, it's the word rakia. We see that it's an expanse, that it is solid. It is beaten out when you see in the book of Job. It is a solid structure. Uh, some say as of ice. 
a, a, support, a, port, a support base. We see that it's uh, holding up God's throne. Uh, so it is regarded by the Hebrews as solid supporting the waters above in the verses that you see there in the Browns Driver Briggs Concordance. When you look at Job 37.18, you see in multiple English translations a variety of ways of describing this thing, but all essentially saying the same thing. This is a hard structure, a mirror cast of bronze, uh, a bronze mirror, a cast metal mirror, molten mirror, molten looking glass in the King James. This is a hard structure up there. Uh, when we look at the sky in Amos chapter 9, verse 6, it talks about a vaulted dome. It's a different word used there, Uguda, if, uh, Aguda, if I'm pronouncing that right, a structure fitted together. But we see in Ezekiel that this structure, this firm structure, uh, there was a likeness of the throne on top of it. We see likewise in Isaiah 66, 1, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. There's something firm up there upon which his throne is sitting. We see in Genesis 1.8, he called the firmament, the rakia, the beaten down metallic structure, heaven, shemaim. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. And he stretches out the heavens, the shemaim, as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Now in the context of Isaiah's time, tent, this is what you might consider like a Bedouin tent structure. Uh, probably more like something like this, a yurt, which is found throughout multiple cultures in the ancient world. Or even today, we might look at it as something like this, a dome tent. Regardless of which idea of a tent you look at, this is what they're saying, that the heavens are stretched out like a tent. So we have the word like or as being a metaphor, right? But tents are always stretched out over a flat surface. Interesting. So we continue. What's placed inside the tent? Genesis 1, beginning in verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the third day how did the dry land appear Genesis just says the dry land appeared but when we go through the uh, Old Testament texts of the prophets we see a more definition as to how that happened Job actually predates Genesis Job was written before Genesis in Job 38 uh, he talks about the laying of foundations the earth was laid out with foundations <coughs> We see that when that was happening in verse 7, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Please note, the sons of God in this context are angels, not the sons of Seth. Keep that in mind as we progress into Genesis chapter 6, because this is the understanding we need to have of the phrase, the sons of God. Uh, we see in 1 Samuel 2, 8, that the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. The world's sitting on pillars. The foundations were discovered. We got pillars and foundations. It's all through the, uh, the uh, Old Testament. Psalm 102.25, Of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth. Proverbs 8.27, When he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, the dry land appeared out of the face of the deep in Genesis. So we get more detail here from these various authors, and there are others. I just didn't have the ability to fit them all on one slide right here. But these are really good to get us started. When we see that the dry land appeared as a result of Yahuwah inscribing a circle on the face of the deep, look up the Hebrew word for inscribe. We see that the Hebrew word is chakak, or kalkak, however you pronounce it, I'm not sure. But basically it means to engrave or to carve something into something else, as if chiseling into like the, the stone for like the Ten Commandments. Please note, you cannot carve a ball into stone. However, you can inscribe a circle into stone, which is what the text says. The word circle is the word chug, which means circle. When we continue to look at this, we see that Isaiah is one of the last authors to write in this regard. A lot of people, when they're describing the earth, want to go to Isaiah 40.22, but you have to realize Isaiah is building upon all the people who had written before him like Job, and like David, and like Solomon, and like Moses. So when we get to Isaiah 40, which is a verse I have used myself to describe the earth, 
Uh, it says, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Well, I took Hebrew 101 twice, so that should give you an indication of my aptitude for learning Hebrew. Uh, and some may say I don't even have that great a handle on English. Whatever the case may be, uh, language 101, words mean things. <laughs> and what's interesting about this, especially if you're a King James only type, um, Isaiah knew the difference between ball and a circle. In Isaiah 22:18, he talks about a ball. The Hebrew word used there is dur, ball. He chose a different word when he described the earth and staying consistent with the other authors who came before him in that regard. So Isaiah clearly knew the difference. The King James translators knew the difference. Now the question is, do we know the difference? Google helps you if you want to Google ball or a Google circle, you might get images such as this. So some say when God looked down on the earth, he saw a circle. Well, if he's looking down from the north, you don't get a circle. The only time you get a circle is if you're either sitting on the sun or directly in between the sun and the earth. If you're looking from any other direction, you get something like that when you're looking down. So I'm just going to put this out there for consideration. I'm not telling you what I believe. I am just putting this out there for consideration. This is a ball. This is a circle. Take with it whatever you want. Here's what really got me messed up in all this. Why am I even talking about this stuff? Because I believe, as all you guys indicated, that we should take the Bible literally. Well, the problem is when I started to do that with regard to this particular subject, I got myself in a lot of trouble. And some of you know what I'm talking about if you've been following my YouTube channel and Facebook page. This one really got to me, though, is when we get to the fourth day, and he talks about the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And it says in three places that he put them in the firmament. Now, I used to teach the same thing that is taught by Kent Hoven and Carl Baugh and others, that the firmament was a canopy, an ice canopy that surrounded the earth. And it's a, good, it's a great theory. And that, you know, so the theory goes, something impacted it probably, and the firmament uh, disintegrated. The windows of heaven, as it were, opened up, and the canopy disintegrated over a period of 40 days and 40 nights, and it rained down on the earth. Great theory. Pretty awesome. There's a couple problems with it, though. Um, number one, uh, we have Psalm 148, verse 4, says, in a post-flood context, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be, at the time of David, above the heavens. There's still water up there. Number one. But this is the bigger problem. When you look up the Hebrew there, you see the, in the red, it's Berukia, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. The, the point is there's a letter bait preceding the Hebrew word. I learned this much in Hebrew 101, taking it twice, that when a word is preceded with the prefix of bait, it means in, not outside and around, which is what the Kent Hove and Carl Baugh thesis requires. The earth surrounded in the firmament and the sun, moon, and stars outside of it. So I saw a video that Kent Hovind did on the two firmaments. And he acknowledged that this is a problem. So he did a whole video talking about, well, the first one was destroyed, but there's one on the outside perimeter of the universe, whatever that means. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> book chapter verse on that, man. I can't prove this at all. Here's the Hovind theory. When God first made the earth, there was earth and space. Then in day two, he put a crystalline canopy above the atmosphere and where Adam and Eve lived and the birds fly maybe 10 miles up, wild guess. And he must have put a second crystalline firmament beyond the stars. People, nobody knows where the star, where does the universe end? And what's on the other side? I don't know. But it says uh, the waters that be above the heavens. There are two, in answer to the, the legitimate criticism that the birds fly in the firmament and the stars are in the firmament, there may be two crystalline canopies and two firmaments. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he was caught up to the third heaven. Hoven theory would be the first heaven is the atmosphere that we're breathing up. Maybe it used to be maybe 10 miles thick and now it's expanded out to 50 or 60 miles. Who cares? It used to have a atmosphere, <clears throat> I'm going to pick a number and say 10 miles thick, a layer of ice, maybe three fingers thick like Josephus and the Jews taught, uh, you know, have always taught. Then stars with bazillions of stars in it going who knows how far, and then another crystalline firmament. And beyond that, I don't know. Uh, 
but Paul was caught up to the third heaven. So the first heaven would be where the birds fly, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven where God lives. Best I can figure out. I love Ken Hovind. I consider him a brother. He is largely responsible for the problems I'm having right now because he came through my little Baptist church when I was in my late teens, early 20s, did his creation week-long seminar, Creation versus Evolution. I got his six VHS set. Remember VHS back in the day? It's like 12 hours of Ken Hovind creation stuff. I dubbed it all to audio cassette and would listen to it religiously in my car until I practically had it memorized and would teach it uh, myself. I loved all that stuff. And he's the one that taught me, he and others, that this is our source for truth. And, of course, he's King James only. This is our source for truth, and we can take it literally. Okay, brother, that's what I'm trying to do. And we're running into problems with that idea of the firmament being an ice can canopy. If you take it literally, from Genesis to Revelation, the earth is consistently described by Holy Spirit-inspired authors as something like this, where you basically end up with a fixed, not moving, spinning, or orbiting earth that is circular with edges, and it has corners, pillars, foundations, etc. And it's under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four. Now, I created this model just trying to take the Bible literally. I'm going, okay, if I just read the text for what it says, and I didn't have any preconceived notions in my mind reading the text, what would I come up with? And that's what I came up with. Something set on foundations, circular, carved you know, in a circle, with a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed. And it seemed to fit all the descriptions that I could see, like uh, Isaiah 66, 1, et cetera. Um, and when I put this drawing out on the internet, somebody sent me this picture of a footstool, <laughs> and I'm going, oh, wow. That looked almost exactly like the depiction that I came up with just going through the, the various descriptions. Now, that's the inside of a bigger structure uh, as I put more descriptives to the model, where I believe it's something along these lines, again, taking the scriptures literally, where there are other scriptures that talks about God walking on the circle of heaven. So I've got a circular platform over the dome, which would serve like as a footstool. His throne is up there uh, on the top. And down below is this thing that's circular with a dome set on pillars. Okay, let's go a little crazier here. What about Job 26.7? He stretches out the north over the empty space, space and uh, place and hangeth the earth on nothing. See? Aha! Job proves the earth is hanging in space. I've used that scripture myself numerous times. See? That proves it. The earth's hanging in space. Well, the problem is Job had a few things to say uh, even prior to Job 26. In Job 9, 6, he acknowledges the pillars of the earth. Uh, we see in Job 38, where he's talking about the foundations and all that stuff and laying the foundation. Other authors in 1 Samuel, we see the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon the pillars. Huh. So could it be, then, that Job's not con contradicting himself or others, but there's another way of looking at this? I think Job is confirming that the earth is hanging on no thing. It is not hanging on or from anything. In other words, all through scriptures we see over and over and over again that it is set on pillars. So if I said to you, I am in want for nothing, you would understand, well, Rob doesn't need anything, right? Well, I think that's in the context of what Job himself has said in chapter 9 as well as in 38, as well as other scriptures, that he's saying the earth's not hanging on anything because all the authors are telling you it's set on pillars, it's on foundations. Now let's revisit what I started with, the three responses. Let's do a little checkup on you. What? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? I, I can see the progression. I, you know, I'm not oblivious to it. Go buy stock and tinfoil, dude. You're a stupid idiot. Okay. What did I say? Search and see if these things be true. Don't believe me. I'm just reading scripture to you up here. Remember? Prove and test all things. Keep doing it. Let's go. <laughs> How many of you have heard of this game, Whisper Down the Lane? Right? We've all heard it. We played it as a kid, right? Who is most likely to have the truth? The one closest or the one farthest away from the original source of information? All right. So if we imagine these six individuals here as 6,000 years of human history, the problem is when you go to the one closest to the uh, source material, all through the ancient world, they're depicting the, wor the earth like this. They're all doing it. Not just the Hebrews, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, even the Greeks until about 200 
uh, BC or so, the Egyptians, all of them had this worldview of the cosmos. Um, this is another graphic somebody did depicting the various verses, and these aren't even all the verses, um, but the various verses that support this idea or at least indicate this idea. Now, I produced a video some of you may have seen a while back called uh, Flat Earth, a Doctor in the Village Idiot. And I'm the village idiot in that story. And in that story, I was saying, okay, when I started doing this and posting videos and showing this stuff, of course, everybody thought I was an idiot, lost my mind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then I found a highly respected individual, Dr. Michael Heiser. Some of you may know him. He's a Semitic language expert. Uh, he's the go-to guy everybody usually goes to when they think I'm crazy. Skiba says this, what do you say? <laughs> um, but what was interesting is in his video, he does a whole 25 minute long presentation, about 20, 25 minutes or so, where he goes through the scriptures line by line and he starts, it says, if we take the scriptures literally, this is what you end up with. And he's on staff at Logos Bible Software, which is staffed by a lot of very intelligent people with letters after their name. And they acknowledge in this very expensive software one of the premier software, uh, Bible study softwares that you can buy on the market today. They have this graphic right here, created by Logos Bible Software, showing that if you take a literal view of the scriptures, this was the Hebraic concept of the universe. So apparently, I've now earned the reputation as the Facebook village idiot these days, and probably YouTube as well, at least according to the internet talk show buzz. I've heard uh, some people tell me that they're mocking me on various radio talk shows and stuff like that, bringing my name up. And of course, the wildly active gossip mill is uh, chiming in as well. And um, I, I, about the time that I was becoming aware of how much my name is being drugged through the mud, I found an article written by Dr. Michael Heiser. It was written about three years ago. In the article, he wrote, uh, literal creationists are actually only selective literalists, or, as I would call them, inconsistent literalists. If one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation description of Genesis 1 at face value, along with other creation descriptions in both Testaments, you'd come out with a round, flat earth complete with solid dome over the earth and earth supported by pillars with Sheol underneath, etc. But creationists who claim the literal mantle don't do that since the results are clearly non-scientific. My view, this is Dr. Michael Heiser now, as readers know, is that we ought to simply let the text say what it says and let it be what it is. It was God's choice to prompt people living millennia ago to produce this thing we call the Bible. And so we dishonor it if we impose our own interpretive context on it. Our modern evangelical contexts are alien to the Bible. Frankly, any context other than the context in which the biblical writers were moved to write is foreign to the Bible. So who's the literalist now, he says. I've pointed out this inconsistency before For ex in, for example, my online lecture about Genesis and its pre-scientific cosmology. What Genesis describes is consistent with all other ancient Near Eastern creation models and shares the vocabulary and motifs of those other pre-scientific cosmologies. That's Dr. Michael Heiser. Now, if you want to get to know who this guy is, you can check him out on Logos.com. Go to Logos.com for Logos Bible Software. Logos.com forward slash academic forward slash bio forward slash Heiser. And uh, you'll see he earned his Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before going to UW-Madison, Mike earned an M.A. in ancient history from the University of Pennsylvania. Major fields were ancient Israel and Egyptology and another M.A. from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Hebrew Studies. He also attended Dallas Theological Seminary. Mike's undergraduate degree is from Bob Jones University, but he also attended Bible college for three years. Mike's dissertation was entitled The Divine Council in Late Canonical and Non-Canonical Second Temple Jewish Literature. The dissertation sought to discern the ancient Canaanite and Israelite roots of Jewish binitarian monotheism and the early church's high Christology. Because of his coursework, Mike can do translation work in roughly a dozen ancient languages, among them Biblical Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Egyptian, hieroglyphs, and Ugaritic cuneiform. He has also studied Akkadian and Sumerian 
independently. Okay, so I mean, and you can. He's got more to that bio. I mean, there's like one, two, three, four more paragraphs you can read on the guy. He's a highly educated individual. Okay, um, he's a biblical scholar. He's a, a Semitic language expert with letters after his name. He's like the go-to guy for ancient Near Eastern languages and cultural contexts that nearly everyone around here uh, in the internet community, they all like to go run to this guy for validation of biblical Hebrew and Greek concepts. And yet he has said exactly what I've been saying regarding the cosmology of the ancient world. Even though I've never consulted anything that he's ever written on this issue until just recently. But if you don't want to listen to the village idiot, then at least listen to Dr. Michael Heiser. And welcome back to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, otherwise known as the village idiot. Um, right before the break, I was talking about Dr. Michael Heiser, super smart, brilliant guy who knows everything about the ancient Near East. He was saying exactly what I've been saying uh, regarding the biblical cosmology. And if you don't believe me, uh, I'm going to play some clips from uh, a online lecture that he has posted on Vimeo. It was dated September 29th, 2010. And he went through many, uh, if not the exact same scriptures that I went through in the previous broadcast where I was going through the, the Bible, uh, showing you all the various verses that support a stationary, flat, enclosed earth under a dome set on pillars, etc., Right, so here is uh, some clips from his online lecture. The Old Testament shares terms and ideas with the ancient Near Eastern pagans. And we've, we talked a little bit about this last week. This should not be a surprise because there are similarities between the conception of how the world that we experience was made that are shared with Israel's neighbors. We see these terms as metaphorical, the terms that I'm going to cover tonight. We, we look at them, you know, when the Old Testament says something like that the sky is supported by pillars. Oh, that's just metaphorical. It's just poetic. To us it is, and you know why? Because we have a scientific worldview. That's why. They didn't. They were serious. No ancient person ever scaled a mountain. Do you realize that? like the tall mountains, because it takes oxygen, they freeze, I mean, all this kind of special equipment. There's no record that any of them ever did it. Okay, until the fifth, it wasn't until the 15th century that we have, you know, the whole issue resolved of, can you sail this way and come out the other, right? You know, the, the whole idea about the earth being a globe and all that kind of stuff, that, that was debated up into the 15th, you know, 15th century. We look at that and go, oh, you know, it's just poetic. It is to us, but what I'm going to say is, again, back to my introduction, if you take it literally, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were serious about it. All these concepts and even some of the terms are part of ancient Near Eastern cosmology. In other words, what I'll show you tonight, the division of the world, what the world looks like in Israelite cosmology, you'll, you can find the same descriptions anywhere else, Egypt, Mesopotamia, you know, ancient Syria, the Hittites, whatever because this was a common worldview. This is what it would look like. I didn't make this graphic, which is why it looks cool. Okay. Somebody gave this to me because they hated, honestly, at Western, uh, they, they hated the one I used, and so they gave me this. This is a three-tiered cosmology. There's God. We're going to see it in the verses. I'll show you that God lives above the vault of heaven, the firmament, and in the firmament, you have windows and doors. Then you have the earth. We're going to see verses that talk about the ends of the round, flat earth here. Underneath is Sheol. Sheol can be both the grave, and it can also be the underworld. Okay? It's, it's not quite hell, but it's sort of like hell. We can talk a little bit about it. And then underneath that, we have the great deep. These are all scriptural terms that are on this map. This is what an Israelite, an Egyptian would have had different terms, but the same three-tiered level, same with the Mesopotamians. Now they have, theologically, they have dramatically different views of 
what's going on here, not just who made it, but what's going on, views of afterlife, the value of humanity. I mean, it's, it's dramatically different. And I've made the comment before, Genesis is about theological messaging. And there are some dramatic differences in what Israel is saying, the Bible is saying, and anything else. So let's take a look at the parts. Waters above and below the heavens. Genesis 1.6, God said, let there be an expanse. Some translations have firmament. It's rakiah in Hebrew. In the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the rakiah, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And what was that expanse called? Heaven. The heavens, the sky. Shemayim in Hebrew. So you have here sky. Okay, and you have waters above the sky. And of course you've got waters below down here. But then you have you know, the atmospheric heavens as well. Psalm 148 mentions the waters that are above the heavens. That's after catch that? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, the water's above. They went away with the flood. See, the, 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 the firmament was this canopy thing, and it was there, and then the flood, it just went away. And... No. It wasn't. According to the psalmist, it's, he's still referring to it. Proverbs 8. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Isn't that interesting? We'll get to that. Circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. Made firm is amatz in Hebrew. It is the same verb for letting a tree grow firm, hard. Ancient cosmology across the board believed that the sky was this dome over the earth and it was solid. Kind of like the Truman Show. Okay. They believe that the stars were affixed to it. Some of the stars never moved, but other ones did. And the ones that did, this is why the word stars is attributed to the sons of God and to angels in biblical literature. They believe that the stars were animate beings, that they were really divine beings, and then they'd come to earth as angels, but they, were, they lived up there. And those were the ones that moved. Why? Because movement shows what? If something moves, it's alive, okay? Again, they can't take a rocket and go up and check it out. They, they believe that this is, they're, they're, there's a solid expanse over them. Another passage, Job 37, verse 18. Can you, like him, you know, speaking of Job, you know, drawing the dramatically poor comparison of God and Job, of course, we know who's going to win there, but... Can you, like him, spread out the skies hard, kazakh, hard as cast metal, mutsak, as a metal mirror? Mutsak is the same word used in the casting of the laver, you know, the tabernacle where they would wash. It's solid. It's also the same terminology used for flint rock. Again, these passages point to the belief that there's a dome, the sky's a dome, and it's solid. And God lives above it, we live below it. Job 22, did I skip one? Did I not? No, I didn't. <clears throat> but you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds veil him so that he does not see, and he walks on the vault of heaven. That's where God lives. It's his address. You know, and b before we, we think, oh, that's quaint, how cute. We think that, don't we? If a little child would ask you, where does God live? Up there. Is there something wrong with that answer? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Use it, you know. Uh, because there's the sense that God lives off planet. Why? Because he created the earth for us. He doesn't need it. He's independent of it. He transcends it. That's all it is. It's very normal. Amos 9.6, he builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. The vault upon the earth. 
who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out in the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. In Psalm 29, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Again, I told you I'm going to be a flaming literalist tonight. I'm going to say that I'm going to take them absolutely at their word. Vault of the heavens, pillars and mountains. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. Oh, that's just metaphor and poetry. Yeah, to us it is. If you ask them, it's like, well, there's that, that, that big mountain thing. I mean, that's like, that's holding up the sky. Duh. If you don't believe it, go find I mean, <laughs> how are you going to find out any different? You know, obviously we can, but, you know, the means to do that isn't with them. Second Samuel 28, the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because God was angry. Windows and doors. And that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. Psalm 78, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. Again, familiar phrases. Pillars under the earth, supporting the earth. Again, look at the language. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. You betcha. It's not Marduk. It's not that silly Ta in Egypt. It's Yahweh who did that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, an Israelite would want you to marvel. He would think you're insane if you didn't, either that or a pagan. Job 38.4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. Again, think of the circle with the, the earth in the middle. For his steadfast love endures forever. Now, that is a very brief overview of Old Testament cosmology. But the message I want you to take away again is Genesis is about theological messaging. And if we look at Genesis this way, it doesn't matter that Genesis is, and the rest of the Bible is littered with this kind of cosmological language because God didn't bother to change the culture. He could have if he wanted to. He didn't care. If he had cared, he would have done it. The only other conclusion is that he couldn't, and then you have a problem with omnipotence. God doesn't care. I'm coming to these people at this time, in this place. They're, it's second millennium B.C. They don't know it's B.C. yet because Jesus doesn't come. But it's a long time, okay, way, 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 way back. And I'm going to give them a message, and they're going to do the best they can under my influence to express it. I'm going to watch as they write. If they goof up, I'm going to send somebody along. Yeah, go fix that. You know, they didn't quite get it right. Somebody will come along and clean that up a little bit. When it gets done with the process, God can look at this thing we call the Bible and say, good job. It's pretty good. I'm satisfied with that. But all of that content is fixed in a particular worldview that we don't have. Okay, we have to let it be what it is and let God, let God's decision to do it that way settle with us. And my challenge to you is try it. <laughs> okay, if you do that, you don't need to justify it to science. They need to justify why they're criticizing it for not being what it was never intended to be. And that would be an interesting conversation. Don't accept that the way they articulate the debate. All right. That's where I'll end that. So clearly, Dr. Michael Heiser fully acknowledges that the Bible absolutely argues in favor of a still flat circular earth with a dome over it. I mean, let that sink in, guys. Go read this guy's bio. A Semitic language expert acknowledges that the Hebrews had the same cosmology as the ancient Near East, which was just the same way it's depicted in the Logos Bible software picture. Now, all the stuff that I've been referring to in this broadcast so far came as a result of me trying to confirm that Logos actually made that picture because I've used that picture quite a bit, and, you know, people – uh, get creative with Photoshop sometimes. So I wanted to make sure that, that was a legitimate 
image created by Logos Bible Software, which is a highly respected Bible tool software you know, program. So as I'm searching to confirm that that was in fact created by Logos Bible Software, I'm finding all these articles that I've been referring to in this broadcast so far, and then I found this video uh, of Michael Heiser saying that. Now, I said it, and people mocked me, and they dismissed it, and they said that the whole biblical flat earth thing, you know, that was just a myth that, that showed up a couple hundred years ago to make Christians look stupid. No, guys. It was the dominant view of the ancient world. Face it. That's what it was until about 1,500 years ago. And this is confirmed, again, by a highly educated intellectual who's one of the big content contributors to Logos Bible software. Okay, so again, if you don't want to believe me, the village idiot, then believe him. Now, that said, he, he, he was, you heard him in the previous session there say that Genesis is uh, about theological messaging. And he, he's basically making the case that the Bible is just there to give us theology, you know, how to understand our relationship with God. Well, hey, that's true. But the creator of the cosmos told several authors, and he read a bunch of them, and I put a whole bunch more in, in the stuff that I wrote long before I ever read any of his stuff. You know, he, the Holy Spirit inspired these guys to describe the earth a very specific way. You know, Mike says, well, you know, God never felt it, the need to correct them in their apparent uh, wrong interpretation or understanding. Well, wait a minute. Why would God have to correct them? He's the one that inspired them to write it in the first place. He'd have to correct himself. He's the one that told them to write it that way. This was the Hebraic concept of the universe, and they were not alone. Like I said, there are many, many other cultures that believe the same thing. So looking at our whisper down the line, we have the guys toward the source material saying, we are on a circular, still flat earth, set on pillars under a dome, within which are the sun, moon, and stars. We get to the end of the line where we are today, and I heard we live on a spinning heliocentric ball in an ever-expanding universe. Huh. Which one is it anyway? If you read the textbooks, the textbooks will tell you that we are on an oblate spheroid. You got this guy right here saying, uh, no, we are, the earth is really pear-shaped. Neil, degra Neil deGrasse Tyson says the earth is pear-shaped. Then, of course, everything NASA puts out shows us pictures time and time again of a perfect sphere. And then we have the Bible over here saying, well, you live in a snow globe. <laughs> so which one is it? I'm asking the question because I'm asking the question. Again, I... It, Zach, with all due respect, put out a video declaring in as much that I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, but Zach and I had conversations before this happened, so it's all cool. We're still buddies. Um, but when he contacted me, he says, okay, dude, I, I just got to tell you, I'm going to put out a video, and I'm going to tell you what it's about. You know, I don't want you to be mad or anything. I'm like, no, dude, that's totally cool. I'm still asking questions myself. Uh, I said, of course, you may realize that I'm going to have to give a rebuttal. <laughs> To your, to your video, which you'll know what I have not done yet because I simply didn't have time. And probably that's a good thing because if I did put out a rebuttal video, video, he would have to put out a rebuttal video and then I'd have to put out and we would never get anywhere ever. Um, in a way, this presentation may be that rebuttal. But, uh, but yeah, you know, when you look through the text, I mean, it is a mind bender. And he did say in his video, Rob Skiba has all but said he's a flat earther. Which is true. I have all but said that I am a flat earther. I have said that I am a zetetic agnostic. A zetetic is a person who proceeds with inquiry and investigation, and an agnostic is somebody who doesn't yet believe you can prove it either way. So that's where I'm at at this point. I, I am struggling with all of those models up there right now because Paul said, prove all things. And I'm having trouble not just trying to prove the snow globe, I'm having trouble proving the ball. Because most of our information on the ball relies on these guys. These guys hate God and make a regular point of, of saying the Bible is full of it and we shouldn't pay any attention to it. It's all fairy tales and fantasy. And it doesn't take but a day of doing research on NASA that you find out that, yeah, there is no reason why you should ever trust NASA. There's a lot of problems with NASA. So, I mean, if it came down to a matter of faith, not proof or evidence, it may be that let God be true and every man be liar is the route that we're going to have to take. I don't know. Um, I'm sort of like Thomas at this point. His buddies that he hung around with that he had no reason to doubt said, hey, man, he's alive. I hear you, but i got to put my finger in the hole. 
And, you know, you may think that's a cop-out, but you know what? I take comfort in that because Yeshua met him where he was at, didn't he? You know, there's people in the scriptures where we say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Um, I take great comfort in the fact that wherever you are in any of these things, he meets us where we are and helps us to get where he wants us to be. So that's my position right now. I'm sort of the Thomas in this. I hear you. I know what the Bible says. I'm out there trying to prove it. Or either way, you know, look at the evidence. I will say I've been finding some interesting things. When I first started the investigation, it was, it was April 13th, right on 13 or 15 of April. And I immediately set out to debunk it. I thought, this is crazy. This is stupid. The knee-jerk reaction everybody has, no way. I'm going to debunk this thing. After I spent about a day and a half trying to debunk it, and finding things in NASA, like all the pictures of the Earth that I was looking at being composites, and they're telling you that they are. It says this is a composite image, this is a 3D rendering. And being a Photoshop expert, I live in Photoshop, I could show you where they're using the clone tool to replicate clouds and how it's totally a, a fabricated image. Uh, I started going, down a, going into a tailspin. <laughs> I'm like, Whoa, what is that? What does this mean? Because how many of you were raised since kindergarten looking at that globe in the corner of your room? We have all have. I have the same knee-jerk reaction you have to this material. So I went six months down a very deep rabbit hole. If you're interested in going down that rabbit hole, go to testingtheglobe.com. Testingtheglobe.com is where I did my brain dump of information, and I've produced 52 videos and have probably 500 pages of content for you to read if you want to check it out. Um, at the end of six months, I said, I'm done. I'm not looking into this anymore. i, I got to get other work done. I, I'm going to hang this whole thing up, and you know whatever will be will be. Um, God kept sending weird things my way. <laughs> uh, I get this package in the mail; it's about this thick, eight and a half by eleven. And I thought, uh, you know, it, I am so busy that if it's more than a page, it goes in the "I'll get to it later" pile, which I almost never have time to get to. So I put this in the "I'll get to the later, get to it later" pile. And then I get this phone call. Now, if you ever try to get a hold of me by phone, I'm very hard to get a hold of by phone because the only time I make or receive phone calls is when I'm in my car, which is typically about a half hour a day, 15 minutes to work and 15 minutes back. Um, if you happen to catch me then, good for you. Uh, this guy caught me, and he's a mutual friend of an individual named Andrew Hoy. How many of you know who Andrew Hoy is? Anybody? Well, he starts telling me, because uh, the name sounded familiar, and it's because I read the label of the package, but I didn't remember it. I didn't associate the two. He told me he sent you a package. I said, oh, yeah, okay. He's like, you have got to look at this package. I said, all right, all right, all right. So I got home, looked at the package, and I, I, I read, read the cover letter, turn the page. He's got all these 3D CAD drawing renderings of the tabernacle in the wilderness. I'm not going to say much more than that because he's not ready for a whole lot of public information to go out on it. But if he's right, it is earth-shattering material. <laughs> Uh, very, very interesting material that actually plays into what we're talking about right here. So this is like a week after I said I'm done looking into this. Then I go to conferences and I meet other people and they're like, hey, Rob, have you known about this? Have you checked this out? No, no. I went to Lubbock, Texas a couple weeks ago, did a Nephilim conference out there. Going to go out there to talk about giants and stuff, right? I get out there and this, this older gentleman takes me outside and he says, and if you've ever been to Lubbock, you can understand why like this entire church are flat earthers. Because every direction you look, it's like flat. He took me outside at night, and he had one of these. This is a Centec infrared thermometer. You basically point it at something, it's got a, a laser, and it tells you the color temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit. So right now, this screen is 73.4 degrees. So he says, let me show you something. It was a half moon outside, nice bright half moon clear night and the moon is shining down on the building casting a shadow on the parking lot so he tests the shadow and it was like 40 degrees let's say he goes now let me show you something else went a few feet over where the shadow had ended and we're looking at direct moonlight and it was 30 degrees the shade of the moon so that's the shade and the shade is 39 degrees and then you go to the moonlight and you got 32 32. Wow. Mm. Or 33. 32, 33. Is it more dramatic when it gets darker? It seems to be more dramatic when the moon is fullest. 
So the moon, like on a full moon, like the full in a completely moon, dark night, sometimes twelve degrees. Twelve degrees. So yeah. the, f the more full the moon is, the cooler it is. It seems to be. It's a half moon right now. I mean, <laughs> don't ask me why, because I don't know, but I know it works every time I've tried it. Everywhere I've tried it. Don't matter if I'm at the ranch or in shallow water. Or went over to my 85-year-old uncle's house and did it in his front yard, and he made me go buy him one. <laughs> <laughs> it was colder in the direct moonlight than it was in the shadow of the moon. Now, when you go outside and test direct sunlight and then test the shadow, the shadow is about 10 to 20 degrees cooler. It's the exact opposite. This is called empirical evidence. This is it's called science, where you can actually do testable, observable, repeatable, you know, things, observations. Now, we're all told that the moon is a reflector of the sun. How does that work if the moon is literally giving off cold light that's warmer in the shadows cast by the moonlight? I don't know. I'm still asking questions. And when I read of numerous accounts that this guy documents and, and footnotes and everything, um, I haven't gone and personally dug up the archives and I haven't had time to do anything like that. But he gives, at least in his time, documented, annotated, footnoted uh, accounts of people seeing the blood red moon lunar eclipse taking place while the sun was still up. Well, I mean, the model that we're all told is the only way that works is if the earth is here and the sun is here and the moon is here in the cone shaped, uh, you know, umbra shadow of the earth. That's the only way you get the blood moon is over here. But yet if the moon's turning into an eclipse and the sun's still up and you're on the earth and you can see both, something else must be causing the eclipse. So, and then when I looked at that, I saw that many ancient cultures believe that there were uh, other dark orbs or dark objects or, you know, invisible objects that were also part of our system. And, and the Hindu uh, version of it was particularly interesting to me, Rahu and Kitu were the two entities that they named as the ones that basically were responsible for, they were decapitated heads, interesting, I used that earlier, that would uh, try to swallow up the moon. Um, but because it's a decapitated head, when this spherical moon object came up on the moon, you know, that's the, the illusion that we see of it turning red, and the moon just kind of goes out the neck of the decapitated head. That's, you know, this is, the mythology develops because the people had a certain mindset and they were trying to explain things. This shows that the Hindus had the same mindset of an enclosed world within which the sun and moon were inside a, 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 a dome. And they were trying to understand, well, what is that thing covering up the moon? And what is that covering up the sun? And I still think the moon is responsible for the solar eclipse, the moon coming in conjunction with the sun. But as far as the lunar eclipse, it can't be the way we're told in modern science if it if it's happening while the sun is still up. So I tend to believe, I mean, hey, why not? In heliocentric, uh, you know, spinning globe, monkey man science, they're all talking about dark matter anyway. So dark matter is like the, the buzzword the phrase these, day, these days. And you got others talking about Nibiru and planet X as a dark planet, uh, supposedly going through our solar system. So why not? You know, if you can embrace that in a spinning heliocentric globe model, why can't you accept it in the possible, you know, enclosed world model. I'm, like I said, I'm a zetetic agnostic right now. I'm looking at all the possibilities, looking at the available evidence and trying to weigh it with reality and see what makes the most sense. Today is Monday, September 28th, about quarter after seven. And you can see that's about the time the sun sets around here, about quarter after seven or so. Sun setting out there in the west. Let's go ahead and uh, punch up my compass app. And uh, let's see here. There's the sun going down in the west. The moon came up in the east just up above that uh, little covered stairwell over there. And it was right about there at roughly 9, 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. And the direction we are looking there is 
about 100 degrees or so. Let's see, yeah, about 100 degrees east is where the moon popped up. The only problem is the sun had just set about an hour and 45 minutes earlier right behind us, and yet the shadow was coming from this direction, which is north. How did the shadow from the earth being cast by the sun, which set in the west, end up coming from the north? It is now 8.15, Monday, September 28th, so about an hour ago the sun went down right over there and directly behind me now the moon is popping up. Like I said, just kind of right above the uh, covered stairwell over there. It was Yesterday was actually a little bit further to the right. So there's the moon about an hour later. Two hours later, last night, it was higher than it is right now, of course. And the shadow was coming from the north, which is where the building is right there to the left. Sun went down in the west right behind us. Shadow of the earth came from the north. We are looking at the compass pointing north. That is north. Here's the buildings. There's the moon. That's west. That's north. That's east. The shadow, allegedly, of the earth appeared on the left side of the moon, which is the side facing north. So if the sun went down behind us in the west, you would think the shadow would have been on the bottom of the moon instead of the left side of the moon. Hmm. Anyway, let's continue. Look at Enoch's enclosed world. Um, my take on the book of Enoch um, is I call it a synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. And the reason I call it that is because there are several books, uh, namely Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees, that are not found in our current canonized text. Enoch, however, has been in and out of various canons, depending on who you're talking to. The Ethiopians still have it in their Bible to this day as a canonized piece of scripture. Whatever. Um, I just say, hey, it's synchronized in the sense that it follows the same chronological order of events that we find in Genesis. I say it's biblically endorsed because there are probably hundreds of references in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, many of which find precedence only in the book of Enoch. So it shows that the authors were clearly aware of this book. Like Genesis chapter 6, Moses throws a word out, Nephilim. He feels no further need to explain it. Well, that presupposes that Moses knew what a Nephilim, what the Nephilim were, and so did his audience because he didn't have to explain it to them, right? Um, Peter and Jude talk about angels that sin that were left their first estate that are bound in chains. We get that text. We, we don't find anything anywhere about angels that are bound up. You know, you might say Lucifer and his angels were rebellious. Yeah, but they're still out and about. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil still goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right? They're still out and about. So who are the ones that were bound in chains and put somewhere? You don't have any frame of reference for that whatsoever unless you read the book of Enoch. Uh, and Jude basically cut a paragraph out of Enoch and put it in his book. So, uh, you know, the, the way I look at it, if we accept that the Bible is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit written by men, then that's a pretty good endorsement by the Holy Spirit. I would be jazzed out of my mind if the Holy Spirit inspired an author of Scripture to, hey, cut and paste out of Rob's book. <laughs> that would do pretty good on sales, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think it's at, at, at the very least it's, a, it's an authoritative text. And when you get to chapter 89, this is how Enoch, who has a vision of the coming flood, describes it. He says, and again, I raised mine eyes toward heaven and saw a lofty roof, i.e. the firmament, with seven water torrents thereon. And those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. Huh? And I saw again, and behold, fountains were opened on the surface of that great enclosure. And that water began to swell and rise upon the surface. And I saw that enclosure till all its surface was covered with water. Do you think 
do you see what he's saying? It's sort of like the flood was just filling up a bathtub, an enclosure. It's a lot different than the description we would think of of the flood covering a ball. He's talking about a roof opening up and an enclosure filling up. With that in mind, when you read Genesis and it talks about the windows of heaven being opened, you know, I got to be honest, when I look at the two models, the one on the left makes a lot more sense to me uh, with that description. Then we look at other descriptions like the face of the earth. The face of the earth, the term face of the earth is used 29 times in the King James Bible. You look up a definition for the word face. It's the front of a person's head, the front of something presented to the view, the principally dressed surface of something with more than one side, for example, the labeled side of a CD, the striking surface, e.g. E the uh, face of a golf club. When you look up the word that's used there, it's panim, the exact same word used in Exodus 33:11 when it says that Moses spoke with God face to face as one speaks with a friend. So where exactly is the face then of the earth? It's the front of something. There are scriptures that talk about on the face of the whole earth. Well, the, the face is, my head is roughly circular, right? Spherical almost. <laughs> this is my face. Would you think this is my face? Did it say Moses talked to God face to face? Or face to face? This is the face on the sphere that is my head. There's a front that is a face. I don't see how that fits on the ball. When we go through scripture and it talks about the pillars over and over again in different places, uh, and it says point blank that he set the world on the pillars. Okay, where are the pillars the earth is supposedly set upon here? I don't see it. We've got some major problems though if we think the world is a ball like we've all been taught. When you go through in a spinning heliocentric ball at like that, let's look at Joshua chapter 10. We've all probably read the story where Joshua commands the sun to stand still, right? Well, if you look at the verbiage here, it says, and he said this in the sight of all of Israel, sun stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Joshua? Again, another endorsement. Uh, they're saying, hey, we all know what's written in this book. You know, I know this is a crazy story, but it's in the book of Joshua, right? Um, this is really interesting because, and I've taught this many times myself, if my understanding of the cosmos is correct, then for the sun and moon to stand still, the earth stopped rotating. Well, in a legal system, words mean things. You have to be very specific, right? And in any legal system, the, the, the wording is absolutely precise in a legal system. So if you're going to take legal authority over a situation, your words matter. In other words, the law is not going to say, well, what he really meant to say was. The law is going to be honored by the words that are used, right? Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You know? So he said sun and moon stand still. He didn't say earth stand still. Right? Now, whether or not I'm ready to accept that we're on a circular flat world inside a dome, one thing I am becoming more and more convinced, in fact, I'd just go so far as to say I'm probably 99% convinced of now, is that this place is not moving and that it's geocentric. And if you haven't looked into that at all yet, there is a documentary you need to check out. Write this down. It's called The Principle. Look up The Principle movie. The Principle. Here is a trailer from that documentary. Science has found evidence that Earth is the center of the universe. Science has found evidence that God exists. So why do they tell us we are insignificant? There's nothing special about humans. There's nothing special about the Earth. In fact, our universe may be one among many universes. And there's no evidence of planning or purpose in the universe. The Big Bang assumes that the only thing that exists is the physical world, and there's nothing beyond that. The truth is, we are significant. We are in a special place. I do believe that the universe was created by God. Always question the scientists and their foundations. They built their careers on this, and it would be admitting a major mistake. So they set up a satellite and they find out these temperature disturbances throughout the universe were all pointing to the Earth. Whoa, what is going on here? This cosmic microwave background is like we are seeing the fingerprint of God. 
the hallmarks of the creator. Man is in a special location for presumably a special purpose. When I see how barren the other planets are and how bountiful the Earth is, something's different, and we're in just the right spot for it. We are in a special place. I do believe that. Science has said stay over in this category here, and you cannot go into the God category because that's going to destroy our science. Now, that is controversial because anyone in the standard cosmology community would not even entertain such a notion. It's just too perfect to be a, a happenstance or a coincidence. This is the movie modern science doesn't want you to see. If you were paranoid, you'd say there's a conspiracy. As a matter of fact, you can go on some websites of NASA and see that they started to take down stuff that might hint to a geocentric universe. I mean, how do you avoid this evidence? They have nowhere to go. It's the moment of truth for science. So, um, I'm keeping all options on the table. You are significant. Get the proof. Spread the truth. Click to download the movie now. That's from their website. Uh, again, they've got, you saw some of the world-renowned physicists out there talking, and they're saying, we can't explain it, but all the indications are we're, we're at the center. You know, now, they're, you see they're still talking from a globe Earth perspective, but they're saying this place is not moving. There have been a number of scientific tests that have been done that prove this place is neither spinning nor orbiting. Well, if even just that is true, we've got to throw out everything we've been taught. Because our understanding of gravity, uh, the, the mechanics of the solar system, all of that goes out the window if we're in a geocentric stationary world, whether it's a flat or, you know, spherical world. So again, uh, watch that documentary, check it out. They make what I think is an extremely compelling case for geocentric uh, stationary world, which then makes more sense when you look at the Joshua story commanding the sun to stand still, because even if it's a ball, He's telling the sun and moon to stand still, and it's, he's within his legal authority to do so by the wording that was used. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so check that out. Excellent video. Other scriptures that are difficult to reconcile. Oh, also, when he's, it, you know, if, if we go with our standard cosmology of a spinning world, when Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, and that would mean the earth had to stop rotating, you've got major problems. The magnetic field goes, gravity goes, there's still a thousand mile an hour wind shear because the atmosphere keeps going. Uh, I mean, you have major problems in the standard model if the Earth stopped rotating. And then when does it say the Earth sped back up to a thousand miles an hour? <laughs> Furthermore, where do we ever see God spinning the world up to begin with? The, you see numerous scriptures saying the world is stationary and it shall not move. There's 67 scriptures that describe the sun, moon, and stars moving, zero describing the earth moving. You got Hezekiah telling the sun, or making the sun dial go backwards 10 degrees. What? <laughs> that means the earth stopped rotating, went backwards, and then spun back up again to 1,000 miles an hour. Wh We've got problems. Okay? We have to have a ready defense, don't we? Be well, atheists and agnostics know this stuff. They do. They had, uh, I've dealt with them. They know it. You know, it's one of the reasons why they mock us. They think our book is fantasy. But what if our book is true? Like we all raised our hand and said we believed at the beginning of this discussion. Uh, you know, th there's problems. You know, th I don't see the, and, and, and if it's a heliocentric world, what in the world was the Earth doing for four days until the sun showed up? I mean, did it just go, oh, okay. <laughs> or was it already spinning around nothing? And boop, the sun showed up. In, but the, in the firmament messes that all up. So, I mean, problems. Difficult scriptures to reconcile. The, the vision in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of a tree that grows so tall that you could be, it could be seen from the ends of the earth. Uh, that's not possible on a ball. So you can say, well, it's just a dream. Okay, but it was a mindset, you know. Uh, you have the devil taking Yeshua to a top of a high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world. That's not possible on a ball. Well, maybe it was a supernatural miracle. Well, maybe, but that would be eisegesis, which is when you read something into the text and it's not there. Um, neither of those are possible on a ball. This is where it got really difficult for me and remains very difficult for me, is when we start looking at descriptions of stars and the hosts of heaven. We have Isaiah in Isaiah 34, 4, and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved 
and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. We have Peter saying the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. We have Revelation, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Um, modern science is telling us that our sun is just one of many stars, and all the stars that we look out there probably have planets going around them. And if you look at the trillions of stars and the billions and billions of galaxies, there's a pretty good chance that there are probably Earth-like worlds, probably at the right Goldilocks distance from their sun. And yet you've got Isaiah, Peter, and John telling us that all those potential worlds and civilizations, all that stuff that we see up there is all going to be burned up because of our sin? <laughs> really? Wow. Let that sink in. Think about what you've been taught about the universe. All that burned up because of our sin. All that world, and all those stars falling to earth? Uh-oh. We have Yeshua saying in Matthew 24 that the stars shall fall from heaven. Repeated in the Gospel of uh, Mark, Mark 13, 25, the stars of heaven shall fall. Revelation, the stars of heaven fell. And we have the dragon also grabbing one-third of the stars and throwing them down to earth. So, okay, how many of you are still taking the Bible literally here? <laughs> All the stars are going to fall to earth. Well, okay, you know, what are the stars then? Are they what modern science and NASA has been telling us? Or are the stars what the Bible has been telling us? We see stars fighting right here in Judges chapter 5. The, the stars fought from heaven. What? Hmm. We see in Revelation, I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Sounds like we're talking about sentient beings here. Again, the dragon taking one-third of the stars and throwing them down to earth. Now, I mean, there are numerous descriptions of stars being a, a word used synonymous with uh, angels. The book of Enoch tells you point blank the stars are angels. In fact, there's uh, there's a, a class of angels known as the heavenly luminaries, and there's a police officer named Raguel whose job is to police them and make sure that they follow the circuit, the path that they are told to march in for the allotted time, six god days, basically. And if they don't follow the pattern, there's a horrible place of punishment in store for the stars that don't follow their appropriate paths. Um, we see the hosts of heaven throughout scripture is a reference both to stars in the sky as well as to gods. Uh, we see in Deuteronomy 17.3, And hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. So these are sentient beings. And note he also lumps in the sun and moon as part of that. The sun is consistently referred to as a he, and the moon is consistently referred to as a she, both in the biblical text as well as the book of Enoch. We see in 2 Chronicles 33.5 that uh, the king built uh, altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Joshua 5, we see they are confronted with a man. They run into this guy who's got a sword in his hand, and he asks him who he is. He says, I'm a captain of the hosts of the Lord. The hosts of heaven are stars, and the hosts of heaven are angels that comprise the army of God. All through the scripture, we see the scriptures also refer to our God as the Lord of hosts the Lord of the heavenly armies. Uh, the armies of heaven in 2 Chronicles 33, 3. Isaiah 22, 14, the Lord of the heavenly armies, the hosts of heaven. This puts a whole new spin then on Revelation 19, where in standard dispensational pre-trib rapture uh, doctrine, we all thought we were coming back on white horses following Jesus. That's not what it says, though. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Where do you see precedence for the bride ever going to war? in scripture you don't you don't see. in fact even the man gets a year off to start building a family before he goes to war but how many of you were taught we're all going to get on white horses and follow jesus back after the rapture nobody am i the only one who's taught that raise your hand if you're taught that okay a few people 
No, it says the armies of heaven, the hosts of heaven, the stars are going to come back. That, if, if we take the Bible literally, then what we have is one third of the stars being cast down with Lucifer when the dragon throws them down and the other two thirds filing in formation behind Yeshua when the big sky dome opens up like a football stadium <laughs> and he comes through on that white horse, the other two thirds file in behind him. If that's not the case, what's the alternative? Stars are, all the stars are going to fall to earth. Just put it in perspective now. Okay? Which one are we going to choose? This is one galaxy right there, and all those specks are stars. And all those stars supposedly have planets going around them, according to NASA and modern science. This is the supposedly the ultra-deep field uh, Hubble telescope supposedly took this picture of a tiny little segment in space, a tiny little segment they found all these galaxies, supposedly, in that one tiny little segment of the sky. Okay, if that's the case, and we take the Bible to try, if we try to force the Bible into a secular scientific worldview, then, I mean, who cares about ISIS, Islam, and the Antichrist? We've got a way bigger problem if Andromeda is heading our way. <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? Do you follow what I'm saying here? Uh, I mean, we got problems if we take the standard cosmological worldview. Uh, and you got scriptures where it says in Revelation that when he comes back, every eye is going to see him. Well, how does that work on a ball? Oh, well, maybe he's making a round trip. Well, it doesn't say that. It, pretty much as I read it, he's got a direct flight from the clouds to the Mount of Olives. Well, what about these guys over here in, in Africa if he shows up on that side of the world? Well, we got iPhones and iPads and the Internet. Well, I've been there. I've been a missionary over there. There are huge sections of the world that still don't have modern technology. I don't know. Anyway, on day five, we had the birds and the fish created. Yay. Then we get to day six, and we see that man was created in the image and likeness of God. Well, going back to the whisper down the lane routine, uh, we got the ancient world looking at it and saying, hey, we were created in the image and likeness of Yahuwah. Today, I heard we evolved from monkeys. <laughs> you see how the whisper down the lane caused a little bit of a problem? Well, I recently found a video clip online from secular scientific uh, a website that described, how many of you have heard that, you know, according to the theory of evolution, we share about 98% of our genetic makeup with chimpanzees. Have you heard that in school? You, have you ever heard how they came to that number, 98%? We've all just heard it, right? We share 98% of our genome with chimps. Okay, the video I'm about to show you is not from a Kent Hovind or a creationist. It's from somebody who believes in evolution, somebody who believes we came from chimpanzees, but actually acknowledging how we got the 98%. Check this out. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human <coughs> scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections, a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. <laughs> but that's what passes for science. Does that sound completely absurd to you? Oh yeah, we just, you know, one point whatever, four billion letters, let's throw those out. Hey, we're 98% the same. What? That's insane. But that's in college level science books being passed off as fact. Guys, that's outrageous. How we can continue to tolerate such absolute absurdity, yeah, it's beyond me. This is not science. All right, this is, this is the natural result of the depravity that comes from ignoring the word of God 
and it's the byproduct of hating God. You have, uh, you have written that uh, God is a psychotic delinquent invented by mad, deluded people. No, I didn't say quite that. I said something rather better than that. Oh, well, please tell us what you said. Please tell us what you um, said. I, well, I would have to read it from, from, from the book. No, please. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. How about, how about if people believe in a God of infinite lovingness and kindness and forgiveness and generosity, sort of like the modern day God? Why spoil it for them? Oh, um... Why not just let them have their fun I'm and enjoy happy. it? I mean, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. I, I write a book, people can read it if, if they want to. Um, I believe that it is a liberating thing to free yourself from primitive superstition. So religion is a primitive superstition? Oh, I, I think it is, yes. So uh, you believe it's liberating to uh, tell people that there is no God? I think a lot of people, when they give up God, feel a great sense of release uh, and freedom. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. Evolution is a fact. It's documented by science. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. Believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. Evolution is also a demonstrated fact. The truth really is out there. It's not a matter of opinion. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but okay. that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design just certain types of designers, such as God. Of course, and this is where Ancient Aliens enters the picture. Coming from an academic like Richard Dawkins. He's like the main spokesperson for evolution these days. Which means if that's the main view of evolution, that's what's making it into the textbooks. And of course, that's what we are being indoctrinated with on a regular basis on primetime television. You know, Ancient Aliens is just one of many shows out there putting forth that idea. <sighs> so, you know, as I'm going through all this stuff and I'm, the question is popping in my head, look, are we going to trust science or the Bible? 46% of Americans believe the story of Genesis is true. So I just it's amazing. want... It's amazing. It's astonishing. I know, that, that the world was created in six days. Here again, another quote from your book. Inherent in the rejection of evolution is the idea that your curiosity about the world is misplaced and your common sense is wrong. This attack on reason is an attack on all of us. 
What do you mean by it's an attack on all of us? In other words, every, everything that uh, the rest of us do as taxpayers and voters and citizens of the world, everything that we do uh, to improve the lives of other people or to improve our own quality of life, to build buildings that rely on our understanding of physics, to build sewer systems that rely on our understanding of gravity, that all of this is inconsistent with this other world view that uh, taken where they take the Bible literally as written in English, by the way, take that literally and deny everything else that gives us all these wonderful things that our society provides, food, clothing, and shelter. So when you are attacking our science or our ancestors who made these discoveries about nature, you are, for me, attacking all of us who embrace it and use it and want to make the world better. So are you urging people to give up on the idea of creationism? Oh, yeah. Please. I get it. You don't want the schools teaching this stuff, or if they do it in religion class, that's one thing, yeah. but certainly not in science class. But I guess alongside that, do you also need parents to stop teaching this to their kids as well? Because obviously, if you're from a religious family, presumably you're going to be hearing this at home as well as at school, yes? I just really want to, in general, it's not religion that's, that's uh, teaching creationism. It's a special subset of a certain religion that's te teaching creationism. I just really want to say it's not a broad brush on that. And so, yeah, the problem, our problem is when parents are brought up with this extraordinary worldview, they bring their kids up with these extraordinary worldviews, and it's really hard to change when you're a grown-up. I mean, it's harder than quitting smoking or what have you. And so uh, our trouble is for a society that needs as many scientifically literate people as possible, and I'm not talking about the United States, I'm talking about the world, Canada especially, uh, we need as many people who are literate, who can make good decisions as voters about what's reasonable, what's a good thing to do, what's not a good thing to do, what we need to uh, put our resources into, what we should not put our resources into. We need those people to understand science well enough to make good decisions. Hmm. And of course, we need engineers and scientists to change the world. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? <laughs> And, and anyway, 40 percent, 45 percent of the American people believe literally in Adam and Eve, believe literally that the world is only 6,000 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a shocking figure and mm -hmm. you can't duck out of it by saying, oh, sophisticated theologians mm -hmm. don't, don't believe it. Unfortunately, what sophisticated theologians believe isn't really relevant to what the majority of Christians do believe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> When we're talking about moral philosophy, when we're talking about the origin of the cosmos, when we're talking about the origin of life, when we're talking about why, why we all exist, there is no reason whatever why we should treat the, the, the writings of scribes in whatever it was, 800 BC, 600 BC, as being particularly wise. We could listen to Confucius, we could listen to the Buddha, there are all sorts of people we could listen to, and we could listen to modern philosophers as well and modern scientists as well. Once again, I come back to the point, there is nothing special about the Bible. Yes, yes, I... You don't believe that the Earth is round only if you're an astronaut. You don't believe Napoleon existed only if you're a historian. You believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. Evolution is also a demonstrated fact. The truth really is out there. It's not a matter of opinion. Oh, really? Uh, you know, I would beg to differ. If you look at the so-called evidence for evolution, it is seriously lacking, and most of it is based on circular reasoning. It's the whole, oh, well, that, uh, that rock layer right there, that's from the Jurassic period. Well, how do you know? Well, because it, we found this dinosaur right here, and we know this dinosaur is from the Jurassic period. Well, how do you know that dinosaur is from the Jurassic period? Well, because we found it in that rock layer right there. And this is what passes for science, okay? 
And it's just like that, exactly like that. And it's pushed on us from a very young age in our secular school systems and movies and television all over the place. This is what passes for science, and it's, and it's indoctrination. That's what it is. And today, 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools are going to reject the Christian faith, mostly because of this great age of the Earth issue. How old is the Earth? Evolutionists claim it's 4.6 billion years old. But what does the evidence say? Let's take a look. There are so many evidences of a young Earth. The Methuselah tree, the Great Barrier Reef, erosion rates. Continents are eroding at a rate that would level them in just 25 million years. We've got comets in our solar system, but they only last 100,000 years. Why do we still have comets? Sahara Desert is growing, oil is still under pressure. Earth's magnetic field is actually getting weaker, putting a maximum age of 25,000 years on it. Earth's rotation is slowing down, the moon is receding, the human population is at six and a half billion. Trace that backwards, it all started 4,400 years ago, right when the Bible says the flood occurred. Why? Because the earth is young, not old. The textbooks in our schools are filled with the idea of millions and billions of years. The next time you hear someone say millions and millions of years ago, stop them and ask, were you there? Science is knowledge derived from observation and study. Can you observe, study, or demonstrate something that happened billions of years ago? Absolutely not. It is true that over half the scientists believe in evolution. That is true, but that does not make evolution true. Just because a bunch of scientists believe something does not make it true. They have a long history of being wrong. They used to teach that a big rock will fall faster than a little rock. They were wrong. They used to teach that if you were sick you had bad blood. This was known as the doctrine of humors. It was believed that if you bled out the bad blood you would get better. There used to be places all over the United States where you could go and get your blood taken out. You knew where they were because out front they had a white pole with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. And right beside George Washington when they were bleeding him to death was a Bible that told them where the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now let's say you went scuba diving and found a sunken boat with a treasure chest full of old coins. You look at one of the coins and it has a date of 1600 on it. You reach in and pull out another and it reads 1700. You reach in and pull out a third coin and it has a date of 1800. Now I'm going to ask you a simple question. When did the boat sink? You ought to be able to figure out that the boat sank after 1800. It could not have sank before 1800 because we have a coin in there from 1800. This most recently dated coin becomes the limiting factor on when the boat sank. There are numerous scientific ways to show the universe is not billions of years old. In 2011, the world's population reached 7 billion people. In 1985, there were 5 billion people on planet Earth. And in 1800, there were only 1 billion people on the planet. Most people agree that there were only about 1 billion people around 1800. The world's population at the time of Christ was about a quarter of a billion people. Starting from the Bible, we see that 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood in which only 8 people survived. And this is exactly what the evidence shows. The current population shows only 4,400 years of growth. God's word is truth. Let's talk about supernova rings. When a star blows up, it creates a nova or a supernova. Astronomers have observed that about every 30 years, a star dies and explodes into a supernova. There are only about 300 supernovas. Let's see, 300 times 30 equals about 9,000 years. Well, if the universe is billions of years old, how come there are less than 300 supernovas? There should be several hundred million of them. This is evidence that shows that the universe is only thousands of years old, not billions. Textbooks say red giant stars evolve into white dwarf stars over billions of years. They teach that it takes billions of years for a star to evolve from a red giant to a white dwarf. Well, we know this is not true. Egyptian hieroglyphs from 2000 BC describe Sirius as red. It was observed to be red as recently as 150 AD. Today it is a white star binary. So no, it does not take billions of years for this to happen. It only takes thousands. 
Jupiter is cooling off and therefore cannot be billions of years old. If it were billions of years old, it would have cooled off by now. Here we have the moon. The moon goes around the earth. I think we can all agree about this. As the moon goes around the earth, it is gradually getting farther away. We are slowly losing the moon. It's leaving us a couple of inches per year. Not a big deal. But if the moon is getting farther and farther away every day, that means that it used to be closer. Well, if we bring the moon in closer, we start to create a problem because the moon is what causes the tides. If the moon were closer, the tides would be higher. There's a law called the inverse square law. If you brought the moon to one-third the distance, you flip the one-third and square it, you get nine times the gravitational pull. If you were to do all the math on this, you will find out that the moon and the earth would have been almost together just over one billion years ago. Walt Brown, in his book, In the Beginning, says that this fact alone puts the age of the earth-moon system at less than 1.2 billion years max. Short period comets are losing material and have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years. If the universe is billions of years old, why do we still see comets? They should all be gone by now. Magnets lose their strength with time. The Earth's magnetic strength has declined 10% in the last 150 years and 40% in the last 1,000 years. Since it is getting weaker, that means that it used to be stronger, and it cannot be more than 25,000 years old. The Earth's magnetic field alone limits the Earth to being less than 25,000 years old. This also means that carbon dating cannot work for more than a few thousand years. The Sahara Desert has a prevailing wind pattern. The wind almost always blows the same direction. This causes the desert to grow. The process is called desertification. They did an in-depth study of the Sahara Desert and came to the conclusion that the Sahara Desert is probably about 4,000 years old. So the desert started growing about 4,000 years ago. If the Earth is millions of years old, why is there not a bigger desert somewhere? Why would the biggest desert on the planet be less than 4,000 years old? Well, let's start from the Bible and see if we can figure this thing out. The Bible says that 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood. It's pretty hard to have a desert under a worldwide flood. So I predict that the oldest desert should be less than 4,400 years old. And it is. Again, God's word is truth. Sometimes when they drill into the ground, they hit oil. And these oil wells can have up to 20,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. That is a lot of pressure. 20,000 PSI. The people that have studied this have concluded that the rock can only hold that pressure for about 10,000 years or less. They say it should have cracked the rock and leaked off in less than 10,000 years. So now I have two questions. Where did the oil come from and why is it still under pressure? Most scientists agree that oil comes from organisms that are changed by heat and pressure turning them into oil. And it does not take millions of years to make oil. In 1971, they learned how to make oil in 20 minutes in the laboratory. In 1996, a proposal was approved in Western Australia that would build a plant to create oil from sewage sludge in just 30 minutes. There's a place in Texas that has turned turkey guts and other waste into oil. They said, we duplicated what Mother Nature does, but what Mother Nature took millions of years to do, we do in about 30 minutes. The Sinclair Gas and Oil Company uses the dinosaur as their logo. They say dinosaurs turned into oil. Mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. Again, let's start with the Bible and see what really happened. 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood. During that flood, lots of animals and people drowned. They got buried by the gravel, rocks, and mud and sand, which got pretty heavy after a while, and eventually they were squished into oil. So the oil that is down there today is from the people and animals that drowned and got buried in the flood of Noah's day. Wood petrifies quickly. Here's some petrified firewood. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. It does not take millions of years to give birth. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's leg still in it. Here is a picture of the oldest tree on the planet. It is called the bristlecone pine. Now, tree ring dating is not an exact science. Trees often produce more than one ring each year. 
but this textbook says the oldest tree in the world is 4,300 years old. Now that is a pretty old tree. However, I have a question. If the earth is billions of years old, why don't we have an older tree someplace? Why is the oldest tree 4,300 years old? Here is a picture of a coral reef. The largest coral reef in the world is off the coast of Australia and is called the Great Barrier Reef. Some of the reef was destroyed during World War II by warships and things like that. Afterwards, some environmentalists studied the reef to see how fast it grows back. They watched it grow for 20 years. After watching it grow for 20 years, they came to the conclusion that the reef is less than 4,200 years old. If the earth is billions of years old, why don't we have a bigger reef someplace? And why is the oldest coral reef less than 4,200 years old? When it rains, 30% of the water runs into the ocean, bringing with it mineral salts. The oceans are getting saltier every day. Today, they are 3.6% salt. They could have gone from fresh water to 3.6% salt in less than 5,000 years. If the earth were millions or billions of years old, the oceans would be much more saltier. If you have ever been in a cave, the guide always says, don't touch the formations because they take millions of years to form. They say this formation in New Mexico started 250 million years ago. I don't think so. Some say that the fastest they can grow are two and a half inches per thousand years. Again, I don't think so. Here are some 50 inch stalactites growing under the Lincoln Memorial that was built in 1922. The photo was taken in the 1960s, so this happened in only about 40 years. It didn't take millions of years. Here's a bat covered with flowstone before it could even rot. Here's a picture of a guy in a building in Indiana that has huge cave formations in the basement from where the water had been leaking through the limestone. The picture was taken only 40 years after the building was built. Here's a picture from a mine in Australia. The mine was closed for 55 years and when they went back in there were these huge cave formations inside that only took 55 years to form. Again, it did not take millions of years for these things to happen. Did you know that at the current rate of erosion the continents would erode flat in 14 million years. Obviously, the continents have not eroded flat, so the Earth cannot be millions of years old. Erosion features all over the Earth show there was much greater erosion in the past, probably from Noah's flood. The whole world was destroyed by Noah's flood. Here we have the Grand Canyon. This textbook says, over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. This textbook says the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. I don't think so. If a dam were built across Grand Canyon, a large lake would form. In fact, right after the flood of Noah's day, there used to be two huge lakes there, Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lakes are long gone, but the beaches are still there. You can still see the beach line. They got too full, went over the top, and washed out that canyon relatively quickly. That canyon is a washed out spillway. So no, it did not take millions of years for the Grand Canyon to form. It formed quickly, just after the flood. That seems a whole lot more reasonable to me. If you've ever looked into a lot of the problems with evolution, uh, you find that there's way more than you're, you are ever hear, certainly in the secular school system. Uh, you may not agree with everything you just heard right there, but if any of those are true, just like the analogy of the coins in the box, you know, when did the ship sink? The youngest one, if it's definitive, if you can absolutely prove it, it sets the stage for the rest of the investigation. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a lot more believable, the, the story of origins and the tangible, observable, physical evidence that we can look at than what we find in the, say theoretical field of science, like what somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson might have to say concerning our origins. In the beginning, about 13.7 billion years ago, all the space and all the matter and all the energy of the known universe was contained in a volume less than one trillionth the size of the point of a pin. Conditions were so hot, the basic forces of nature that collectively described the universe were unified. 
For reasons unknown, this sub-pinpoint-sized cosmos began to expand. When the universe was a piping hot 10 to the 30th degrees and a youthful 10 to the minus 43 seconds old, before which all of our theories of matter and space break down and have no meaning. Black holes spontaneously formed, disappeared, and formed again out of the energy contained within the unified field. Under these extreme conditions, in what is admittedly speculative physics, the structure of space and time became severely curved as it gurgled into a spongy, foam-like form. During this epoch, phenomena described by Einstein's general theory of relativity, the modern theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics, the description of matter in its smallest scales, were indistinguishable from one another. As the universe continued to expand and cool, gravity split from the other forces. Quickly thereafter, the strong nuclear force and the electro-weak force split from each other, which was accompanied by an enormous release of stored energy that induced a rapid 30 power of 10 increase in the size of the universe. The rapid expansion of the universe, known as the epoch of inflation, stretched and smoothed out the cosmic distribution of matter and energy so that any regional variation in density became less than one part in 100,000. Continuing onward with what is now laboratory-confirmed physics, the universe was hot enough for photons to spontaneously convert their energy into matter-antimatter particle pairs, which immediately thereafter annihilated each other, returning their energy back to the photons. For reasons unknown, this symmetry between matter and antimatter had been broken, which led to a slight excess of matter over antimatter. For every billion antimatter particles, a billion plus one matter particles were born. This asymmetry was small, but really, really important for the future evolution of the universe. As the universe continued to cool, the electro-weak force split into the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force, completing the four distinct and familiar forces of nature. While the energy the photon bath continued to drop, pairs of matter-antimatter particles could no longer be created spontaneously from the available photons. All remaining pairs of matter-antimatter particles swiftly annihilated leaving behind a universe with one particle of ordinary matter for every billion photons, and no antimatter. Had this matter over antimatter asymmetry not emerged, the expanding universe would forever be composed of light and nothing else, not even astrophysicists. Over a roughly three minute period, protons and neutrons assembled from the annihilations to become the simplest atomic nuclei. Meanwhile, free-roving electrons thoroughly scattered the photons to and fro, creating an opaque soup of matter and energy. When the universe cooled below a few thousand degrees Kelvin, about the temperature of fireplace embers, the loose electrons moved slowly enough to get snatched from the soup by the roving nuclei to make completed atoms of hydrogen, helium, and lithium, the three lightest elements. The universe is now, for the first time, transparent to visible light, and these free-flying photons are visible today as the cosmic microwave background. Over the first billion years, the universe continued to expand and cool as matter gravitated into these massive concentrations we call galaxies. Between 50 and 100 billion of them formed, each containing hundreds of billions of stars that undergo thermonuclear fusion in their cores. Those stars with more than about 10 times the mass of the Sun achieve sufficient pressure and temperature in their cores to manufacture dozens of elements heavier than hydrogen, including elements that compose the planets and the life upon them. These elements would be embarrassingly useless were they to remain locked inside the star. But high-mass stars fortuitously explode, scattering their chemically enriched guts throughout the galaxy. After seven or eight billion years of such enrichment, an undistinguished star was born in an undistinguished region of an undistinguished galaxy in an undistinguished part of the universe, the outskirts of the Virgo supercluster. During the formation of this star system, matter condensed and accreted out of the parent cloud of gas while circling the sun. The gas cloud from which the sun formed contained a sufficient supply of heavy elements to form a system of planets, thousands of asteroids, and billions of comets. For several hundred million years, the persistent impacts of high-velocity comets and other leftover debris rendered molten the surfaces of the rocky planets, preventing the formation of complex molecules. As less and less accretable matter remained in the solar system, the planet's surfaces began to cool. The one we call Earth formed in a zone around the Sun where oceans remain largely liquid in form. Had Earth been much closer to the Sun, the oceans would have vaporized. Had Earth been much farther, the oceans would have frozen. In either case, life as we know it would not have evolved. 
Within the chemically rich liquid oceans, by a mechanism unknown, there emerged simple anaerobic bacteria that unwittingly transformed Earth's carbon dioxide rich atmosphere into one with sufficient oxygen to allow aerobic organisms to emerge and dominate the oceans and land. These same oxygen atoms, normally found in pairs, O2, also combined in threes to form ozone, O3, in the upper atmosphere that protects Earth's surface from most of the sun's molecule-hostile ultraviolet photons. The remarkable diversity of life on Earth, and we presume elsewhere in the universe, is owed to the cosmic abundance of carbon and the countless number of molecules, simple and complex, made from it. How can you argue when there are more varieties of carbon-based molecules than all other molecules combined? But life is fragile. Earth's encounters with large, leftover meteors, a formerly common event, wreak intermittent havoc upon the ecosystem. A mere 65 million years ago, less than 2% of Earth's past, a 10 trillion ton asteroid hit what is now the Yucatan Peninsula and obliterated over 70% of Earth's species of flora and fauna, including dinosaurs, the dominant land animals. This ecological tragedy pried open an opportunity for small surviving mammals to fill freshly vacant niches. One big-brained branch of these mammals, that which we call primates, evolved a genus and a species, Homo sapiens, to a level of intelligence that enabled them to invent methods and tools of science, to invent astrophysics, and to deduce the origin and evolution of the universe. Yes, the universe had a beginning. Yes, the universe continues to evolve. And yes, every one of our body's atoms is traceable to the Big Bang and to the thermonuclear furnace within high-mass stars. We are not simply in the universe. We are part of it. We are born from it. One might even say we've been empowered by the universe to figure itself out. And we've only just begun. <laughs> when science continues to put out fiction like this, I mean, who needs Hollywood? And we've only just begun to prove how completely absurd we can be with our theories. I mean, seriously. Uh, I just watched a show recently. On, uh, it's on Netflix. If you have Netflix, you can look up a, a show called The Universe. And uh, I believe it's um, episode uh, 12. Ch you you got to check this out. Go to Netflix.com, look up The Universe, and search for... Episode 12, God and the Universe is the, is the title of it. God and the Universe. Consider a scientific approach in weighing the idea that God created the Earth and even the Universe versus the theory that it all came from nature. And, of course, you know where that show is going to go. Um, you know, they, they give a nod to the biblical ideas, but the whole rest of the show is saying, basically, we have no need of God. You know, that, that's that's what it comes down to. And, okay, yeah, and, and, and these people... A lot of these people, you, you listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, Richard Dawkins, and, and a lot of these guys. They all mock the idea of God and, and outwardly tell you, why would you live your life by an ancient book? You know, they mock the Bible. They mock God. They say there's no need of it. You know, and, and Dawkins is like belligerent against it. He's like Captain Atheist. Um, and so you, let's put, you know, they mock us as lowbrow, you know, idiots for believing the things that we do. Let's put it in perspective. They think they came from monkeys, okay? I don't care how many letters they have after their name. You know, these guys go to school, they read books, they come out believing they came from monkeys, and then they have the audacity to say that we're the stupid ones. Okay, so here's a clip from, uh, here's a few minutes worth of, uh, of that show. Listen to what they have to say. In the beginning, there was darkness, and then, bang, giving birth to an endless expanding existence of time, space, and matter. Every day, new discoveries are unlocking the mysterious, the mind-blowing, the deadly secrets of a place we call the universe. It is, of course, a mystery as to why the universe exists in such an intelligible manner, but it suggests to me, at least, that there's a deep link between the universe, the grand scheme that's unfolding, and beings like ourselves. Somehow, the universe has become self-aware. It's engineered the emergence of comprehending, thinking beings like ourselves who can come to know the universe. Some people marvel at the fact that the universe has, over billions of years, given birth to beings who can appreciate its complexity. 
we can even ponder where and how we fit in. But at the dawn of history, people thought they knew the answers to these profound questions. The ancients viewed their world as a snow globe. It was essentially a flat earth, say a disk, covered by a dome. Uh, and we call this in English a firmament. And in the firmament is where all the stars and the planets were hung. Almost all ancient cultures believed their universe existed in a dome similar to this one. And they never questioned who created it. The ancients assumed that there was a god or gods responsible for the creation and the maintenance of the universe. The idea that God created the universe went largely unchallenged until the Middle Ages, when scientists made a sacrilegious suggestion based on their observations. The sun, not the earth, was at the center of the universe. It was a paradigm shift. There is now another way to explain the naturally occurring phenomena around us, and this is science. Since the Middle Ages, scientists have developed sophisticated new theories about the enormity of the universe and our place in it. Theories that often have no room for God. Many phenomena have appeared mysterious or miraculous or magical. And then through the process of science, we've eventually understood them. Scientists gradually realize that the sun really is just one star among a multitude of stars in a gigantic galaxy, having hundreds of billions of such stars. And all this was created in a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. But while scientific theories, observations, and experiments tell us where we are in the cosmos, they don't answer the eternal questions. Why we're here, and who, if anyone, created us? So while it appears a divine creator planned the universe, many physicists say apparent fine-tuning doesn't prove anything of the sort. Something else must be at work. But what other than God could possibly explain the remarkable series of events that led to the creation of life in our universe? One very popular contender is an idea that seems at least as incredible as the idea of God. It's the multiple universe theory. A very large number of universes, perhaps even an infinite number, could in principle exist in a vast hyperspace. We can understand the idea of hyperspace by comparing it to a mug of beer. The beer mug would be the hyperspace and the bubbles would be these individual universes. The bubbles in a beer mug are all physically about the same. But suppose they span a range of properties. Some of them might have carbon and oxygen and stars and gravity and others don't. We would be in one of the ones that leads to a rich, complex universe culminating with life as we know it. If there are an infinite number of other universes, the fine-tuning that seems to be present in ours isn't an example of God's plan, but rather the law of statistics. Most of these universes wouldn't naturally develop in ways that fostered intelligent life but a few would. So then the explanation for the specialness of the universe is that we are winners in a gigantic cosmic lottery. It stands to reason that we couldn't be living and discussing this in a universe that was hostile to life. Only the bio-friendly ones get populated with thinking beings. Having a multitude of universes is actually quite a simple and natural consequence of some of the most favored models for the birth and early evolution of our universe. It's kind of like stars and planets. As long as you have the capacity to make one, it's easy to make lots of them. Oh, really? <laughs> wow! Beer mug hyperspace multi-bubble verse. Really? <laughs> Seriously, you guys just you have to watch the show. 
Do you have Netflix? Watch it. Watch the whole thing. And then realize that these guys are all talking out of their butt. They're farting out beer bubble universes. Okay. That's what they're doing. Hey, I got an idea. Yep. Multi beer bubble universe. And they call that science and they make fun of us. Really? Yeah, I'm not going to take that from them anymore. You know, it's bad enough that we take, you know, ribbing and abuse from fellow Christians that say they believe in the Bible. You know, that, that's another issue. But I'm not going to sit here and let people who think they came from monkeys out of a beer bubble fart universe um, ridicule me for <laughs> looking into what I'm looking into and considering, you know, a possibility. If you guys can think about beer bubble universes, then I can think about a snow globe. Fair enough? Okay, let's move on. Science says the universe came about from a big bang. The Bible says it all in one, i.e. uni, verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science says the stars, including our sun, came first. The Bible says the sun and stars didn't show up until day four, after the earth was created and already producing life. Science describes our solar systems with planets going around a fixed sun. The Bible describes it, an Earth-based system with the sun, moon, and stars moving over it. Science says the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour and orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The Bible says in about 67 places that the sun, moon, and stars are moving, but never says anything about the Earth moving. Rather, we consistently find that the Earth is fixed and unmovable, set on a firm foundation of pillars. Science tells us the universe came into being nearly 14 billion years ago and that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The Bible tells us it all began less than 6,000 years ago. Science tells us that humans arrived on this Earth, as Kent Hovind would say, from goo to you by way of the zoo. <laughs> the Bible says that we were divinely created in the image and likeness of Yahuwah. Science tells us we are on a spinning heliocentric globe in an average galaxy among billions of galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. The Bible tells us we're on a still flat earth that is, was inscribed as a circle into something with four corners set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. So who should we believe? Science or the Bible? Now, I have spent time refuting all of the other points except for the last one. Ken Hovind has spent time refuting all of the other points except for the last one. Other creation scientists have spent time refuting all the other points except for the last one. When I listened to Kent Hovind, and again, I love him. I love him dearly. Um, but when he came out of prison, people started sending him letters, and everybody's asking him about flat earth. So I can only imagine what he's thinking. What? I go away for nine years, and people are talking about flat earth? What in the world's going on here? But his response was, look, we've all seen the pictures in the textbook. The earth is a sphere. Get over it. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Hovind, you mean the same textbook you spent your entire career saying is full of it? That we couldn't trust? So I'm asking you the same questions, questions I'm asking myself. What about this last point? I mean, even if we just go to the point of the stars in the universe, they cannot, uh, either this is true or it's not true. The stars cannot be what we have been taught if all the stars are falling to earth. You have Isaiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Son of God himself, Peter, and John, all four saying the stars are going to fall to the earth. The universe can't be what we've been taught if that's the case. So, going back to one of the statements I made at the beginning of this talk, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is a proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. I'm going to suggest to you, first start with the Bible, then if you have not yet read these three books, you have not yet done any investigation at all. These books right here are Zetetic Astronomy by Dr. Samuel Robinum, written in 1865. This one right here, 100 Proofs, Earth, Not a, Gro Not a Globe, by William Carpenter, uh, 1885. And this one right here, Terra Firma, Earth, Not a Planet, Proof from Scripture, Reason, and Fact, by David Wardla Scott, written in, I believe, 1901, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I read these three books through and wept. These three individuals were men of God taking a stand against the science of their day. They were standing up against the Darwin and Char Charles Lyell and Huxley's of their day. In the 1800s when, you know, Lyell 
looked at a bunch of stripes on the rock and said, well, I think that represents millions of years. No proof, no evidence, no way to test it. I just think all those layers represent millions of years. Darwin says, hey, that's great, because I think we came from monkeys. Maybe it took millions of years for us to evolve. Cool, they link arms with Huxley, and they're off they go. But yet these men of God were taking a stand saying, the word of God says we were made in the image and likeness of God, and this place showed up about 6,000 years ago. And then they took it a step farther and addressed the issue that we've been talking about in this presentation. And again, if you haven't read these three books, you haven't done any investigation. If you haven't started going outside and start doing some tests for yourself, you haven't done any investigation. So we can laugh and mock and throw stones and say you're an idiot, but have we really done the investigation? I've spent six months doing the investigation. I've been reading the books. And when you go through those books, yeah, you may be able to refute a few of them. You will not refute all 100 proofs. There's other videos out circulating on YouTube now with 200 proofs. But I'll tell you something, guys. I have seen footage at over 130,000 feet, flat as a pancake, the horizon. I've seen a German rocket video, uh, a video from a German rocket shot up to 161 miles. Horizon was flat as soon as, the, as soon as the image went across the center of the lens. A fisheye lens is going to be the most accurate, correct me if I'm wrong, when it goes across the center of the lens, right? It's going to be about as accurate as that lens is capable of rendering an image when, the, when whatever you're looking at goes across the center of the lens. And so when you know, the Earth's coming into view, it starts doing the morphing thing. But as soon as it gets across the center of the lens, it's flat at 161 miles high. Uh, and I've seen footage at 65 miles high that was shot back in the um, early days of the space program, just before the space program was getting started with the V2 rocket, sent to 65 miles high, flat. So I'm going, look. You know, I don't know what to do with that. What is it? I mean, look at that. You know, a dude's taking a picture of Chicago from 60 miles away. That's impossible. You can't see on a ball. The, the, the land that you're standing on and the land that Chicago is on should be almost a half mile below the curvature of the earth, according to spherical geometry. And yet Joshua Nowicki took a picture of the Chicago skyline from almost 60 miles away across Lake Michigan. The weatherman who saw the footage of the Joshua Nowicki picture said that it was a mirage. Well, if you've ever seen a mirage, mirages are inverted, wavy, and distorted. This was perfectly symmetrical, perfectly clear. The cities weren't leaning this way or that way, as you might expect on a ball. Perfect skyline of Chicago. I've been talking to people who live in this vicinity of the same place that Joshua Nowicki took the picture, and they say, we see it all the time. Everybody's seen Chicago. So the weatherman said, when the cold air from the water in the lake meets the warm air you know, in the summertime, you get an inversion in the mirage, and you're seeing a, an illusion. OK, so let's go when the water's cold and the air's cold, and you're not going to get a mirage. Let's do it. So be prayerful. You know, um, I think this could be a really fun project. I'm not so much going to try to prove the Earth is flat. I'm trying to go and prove that the Bible's true and literal. If, if it turns out it's a ball, then I can no longer say this is literal. That's the problem we're going to run into. I'm going to say, okay, then every video and every lecture we've ever done, whenever we say we take the Bible, Bible literally, we can't do it anymore. We'll see what happens. I, I am becoming more and more persuaded uh, of the flat earth, obviously, if you've been watching my materials and seeing it. Um, but I can't just come out and say, it is flat. It is enclosed because I haven't found that solid, absolute, irrefutable proof for it yet. And you know what? That might be a good thing because I'll tell you something I've learned in all this. You can convince somebody of just about anything if you put compelling images up and a little dash of charisma. You can make anybody believe anything you want them to believe. And because I'm aware of that, I know that I have that ability to do that too. And I don't want to be guilty of... Uh, you know, plenty of people have become flat earthers because of my material. And I say, well, you know, if that's what you believe, uh, okay, great. Uh, but I have said repeatedly in all my stuff, I, look, I'm still questioning all this stuff. I haven't come out and said, I did say at one point, if anything's going to make me a flat earth, flat earther, it's this the, that video that NASA put out of the um, the moon crossing in front of the, of the earth. But then I ended up debunking myself on that one. So, um, I can't, that one, that one video right there, I thought, I thought it was it. I thought, okay, finally, I could commit to something here. I've got the proof. Did a little experiment right here in my hallway. And I'm like, okay, shoot, I just debunked myself. Okay, well, you know, the part, I, I, don't, I don't have, it, it's not about ego. It's not about pride for me. I don't, I don't, it's not about me being r right. 
you know, um, and, and uh, I'm going to ignore everything else. I just want to know what the truth is. I don't want people just to believe me because I might have a little bit of charisma and can put some pretty cool images up on the screen. I want, I want to know what the truth is. I accept that the Bible is true, but it also tells me to prove it. And as I'm trying to prove it, I'm putting the evidence out. And, you know, so that's what I would just say is a word of caution to everybody, even watching my videos, even listening to me. Um, you know, I, I know that the imagery can be compelling and I know that I have a, a measure of charisma that people can gravitate towards, but you know what? So did Hitler, <laughs> you, know, you know, so let's put things in perspective. I mean, this guy had an, an amazing amount of charisma. When you look at the, the, the videos that show the ocean of Nazi soldiers listening to this lunatic talk, you know, I mean, he, that, that, that's dangerous. You know, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously aware of that. And it would just say, look, I, I tell people when I do my conferences, don't believe me, <laughs> please don't believe me. Do your own research, test it for yourself. I'm doing my research and I'm making it public, but even that test that, you know, test my research for yourself. Cause I, the last thing I want to be responsible for is leading anyone astray about anything. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to lead anybody astray in any subject, you know, so I'm aware that as a teacher and as a public fi figure, people follow me and I'm saying, look, don't, I'm, this is sort of like the blind leading the blind here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I, I just, I, I don't know if I'm articulating what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling right now, but when it comes to this issue, I do think it's critically important because it affects everything. If this is what biblically speaking is the great deception the, the Bible talks about a great deception that's going to come and be so great that even God's own elect, his own people would be deceived by it. I don't know what, I mean, if this is, if it, it turns out to be true that we're in an enclosed flat circular earth set on pillars within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed, then we're in the great deception right now because there are vast amounts of Christians, including Kent Hovind, Brother Hovind, and others that are dogmatically against what I believe the scripture tells you point blank and up from a literal interpretation that they're against it. And, and they're embracing evidence that is coming from primarily NASA, the government, and the military, three organizations that have proven to be completely untrustworthy on numerous counts. If we were to put them on trial, you know, they would all be guilty of being pathological liars. And, and I would say also Luciferians uh, in many ways, because of all the secret societies that our presidents have been involved with. And, you know, why is our astronauts have to be Freemasons, you know, you know, stuff like that. So uh, I'm saying at this point, we need to be testing all things, test everything, because with this model, with this, with the, with the uh, enclosed world model, evolution goes out the window. Ancient aliens, that whole idea obliterated. And what are you left with? A creator that made a terrarium that we're in. <laughs> I mean, so people ask, well, what would the, what's the motive? If we really are, if, if, the, if the spinning heliocentric globe is wrong, what, why the mo what's the motive for NASA to be lying to us? Well, let's go back to, the, you got to go further back than NASA. You got to go further back than the United States government or any other government. You got to go back to the garden, Genesis chapter three, where the serpent comes to Eve and basically says, did God really say that? Hath God really said? Because that's what this boils down to, ultimately. The Bible says this in no uncertain terms. We're in a snow globe. Did God really say that? See, that's the motive. That's the, and, and all of those who follow that Luciferian uh, mentality of getting it. Charles Lyell got us to question the timeline of creation. Darwin got us to, to question whether we are created in the image and likeness of God or from goo to you by way of the zoo, as Ken Hovind would say. You know, those two individuals throw out huge portions of, of the Genesis account. Well, the same science that came out of those guys and from which those guys, those guys originated also from uh, science that was contrary to the biblical account, we are presented with the spinning heliocentric globe. You know. So, I mean, motive makes all the sense in the world if you realize that if the enemy of mankind can get us to question Genesis, if Genesis crumbles, well, the foundation upon which the whole of Scripture is sitting is destroyed. I mean, everything crumbles. I mean, if, if Moses is full of crap, what does that say about Jesus? Because he, he endorsed Moses. 
you know? Um, so for me, this is a very weighty issue. And it makes sense to me in a way that this is coming up in the 21st century, because if we are indeed in the days of Noah, where we are starting to see a repeat of what took place that led to the corruption of all flesh and evil continually and violence, you know, um, then it, it, in the book of Daniel, it says in the last days, knowledge would in, will increase. And the Hebrew there, it, the letter He precedes the word, and the letter He is the. It's the knowledge will increase. So could it be that that's what we're seeing right now, is the original knowledge is increasing all of a sudden? I mean, boom, who was talking about this last year? You know, maybe, maybe uh, Eric Dubay, maybe, and a few others. But now it's like one of the primary hits on Google right now, uh, keyword search is, is flat earth. So for me, I, I'm trying to nail this down because if, if this is the truth, then it exposes so many lies, it's unbelievable. And at that point, you, you are forced to say, I can never trust NASA. I can never trust the government of any country in the world. Well, who can I trust? Well, the only one I can trust then is the one that proved this model is true and that model is false. And that would be the, the creator of this terrarium. Uh, that's pretty big. Thank you very much for the first presentation. If you want more information, go to testingtheglobe.com. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.